All right, so I want to share my screen now. Okay, so Eves and Tech is a platform dedicated to closing the gender gap between women and technology. And recently, we we expanded our reach. We expanded to immigrants. We expanded to people of color. You know, we expanded to black people generally. So we are we are we are bridging the gap between women, immigrants, people of color in general. That is, those are those are the people that we are serving at the moment, and we offer several non-coding courses. And the way we are building this gap is by is by offering non-coding courses because of the misconception that people need to get into tech only through coding courses. Meanwhile, they can do it as well without doing so much of coding courses, except along the line they choose to do so, maybe due to interest or any other thing but it is not it is not the only criteria to get into the, into tech and we've been doing it for a while and our students have been working in really fantastic places so these are the courses that we offer we have business analysis data analytics data governance product design program marketing bioinformatics salesforce amongst others so this information will not be new to our students that are joining us is only going to be new to people that are joining us for the very first time. And a little about our founder, Bisala Labi. She's a mother of three, and she's also um, a wife. I mean, she she's both managing uh, the home front and also managing our uh, business. And she's doing fantastic in it. She started it over ten years now, and she has never touched a line of code. And this has helped. Um, and and this was what really. It really made her to want to come into the industry to let people know that they really do not have to do what they, I mean, do much with coding before they excel in in the tech space, right? So um, the gap between women and technology, watch families lose their jobs to digitization and decided to do something about it. And especially those that they feel like, oh, that they they are no longer relevant and they are already, they are already, giving up they can they can learn digital skills that is going to help them stay relevant in their workplace and all that so she sets up a platform where women who have increasingly become breadwinners can, can acquire non-coding technical skills and apply for a high quality job in less than two months the result has been phenomenal and we are committed to doing more I got to do work. So we, are, we are fully yeah, trained. Yeah. We are fully That's online, true. and we are trained from twenty-two countries. As a, as a matter of fact, right now we are trained from more than that. We have from China, we have from Finland, we have from Suriname, you know, and the likes. Mm -hmm. Several ones from France, from Ghana, and the rest of them. So this this has been made possible by the virtue of hands-on training and quality of facilitators who ensures our students get value. We try as much as possible to get good facilitators that will be able to impart knowledge and i mean the kind of knowledge that is going to be um that will be valuable even in the global space i mean not just not just not just in maybe Nigeria or maybe in canada anywhere you get to you should be able to make use of the same skill and thank uh, god tech what? is a universal uh, language it's the same thing that they are speaking in canada that they will be speaking in uk when it comes to tech so this uh, this who ensures us then gets value and also monitor them during interview sessions amazingly we have trained students from various backgrounds such as stay at home moms undergraduates lawyers medical doctors people who wish to immigrate amongst others so our aim is that by 2030 we should have trained over 100 million african women through paid and free sessions such as this as of as at the moment we have over five thousand already that we have already trained and um, both paid and free so we hope that by 2030 we'll be able to do we'll be able to achieve our aim and not just women we've also added ladies young girls 
to our scheme. Of recent, the the our our founder Bisola Alabi, she launched a book called Jasmine Discovers Tech and um, Tech, and the book has um, found so much support from 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 different individuals that have given given to the project to ensure that the, this the book is given free of charge to young girls in secondary school we started already on international day of girl child we started from um, international school of lagos and we've been doing that we'll still continue we have lots of projects to do in the coming year so that is about eels and tech and this is where our students work this is where our students work please can everyone still hear me if you can hear me please unmute yes and we can yes. All yes. right, thank you. All right, thank you. So this is where our students work, at least the ones that we know. <laughs> the ones that we know, this is where they work. And we have lots of people that also want privacy. So we don't put everything out there. We just greet them and then we just take notes of those places. So um, briefly about our guests. So our guest tonight is... Mr. Tomiwa Adefoku. I really hope I did not mess up that name. <laughs> I really hope I didn't mess up that name. So he's a lead AI engineer. So Tomiwa is a distinguished technology innovator and the visionary founder behind the revolutionary GPT desk project. As the lead AI engineer, he has carved the niche in the realm of generative AI developing platforms that seamlessly blend that this project has empowered users to transform abstract ideas into tangible impactful solutions democratizing access to ai technology all right so at this point i'm going to let mr Tomua do further introduction of himself luckily for us you know there's, there's something about teams and tech we try as much as possible to build community so Mr. Tomiwa is husband to one of us, to one of our ex-students. Mm -hmm. And then we are coming together once again to still work together with our husband. So we we, we enjoy the community we have, our alumni community, wonderful people, even the students in their in their groups, wonderful people, the way they relate with one another, <laughs> that will continue to exist between us and <laughs> our students. So at this point, I'm going to be inviting Mr. Tomoa to please unmute his mic and take up the session. Thank you very much. Evening, everyone. Good evening, uh, sir. Yes, my name is Tomoa Adepokon, as she has introduced. Uh, she has said a bit about me, probably more than I can say myself. But uh, yeah, I'm happy to to be here today to discuss about generative AI, and I'm happy to meet everyone. And I hope uh, by the end of this conversation, um, go on and do great stuff. Okay. Um, Getting straight into the business of today, let me quickly project my my screen. Oh, my command, say, oh, my command, say. What are you going to do? Okay, so we want to discuss about generative AI generally. And we'd also uh, okay. focus on how, oh, I'm go back. on how we can, you know, take advantage of this uh, new technology that is, you know, taking the world by storm for our own growth. Uh, professionally, in our business, uh, or in anything that we do, essentially. As we go on, we'll see, you know, different benefits 
uh, of this uh, new technology, the areas where we can leverage it. There is nothing good that is not without uh, challenges. We we'll also discuss, you know, some of some of those uh, challenges, and then we'll go on to demonstrate some solutions and see what we can quickly pick up and do. As EOS and Techs focus on uh, no code solutions, we we'll also see how we can get into um, AI solutions development without using code. Okay, um, use and tech, do I need to, I imagine you want to say something, your hand is up. Yes, yes please, yes, please, good evening. Um, Please, can you help mute people who are not speaking, but their mics are uh, trapped that said you should please help mute their mics so that you can stop distracting people. Thank you. Okay. I hope I've not muted myself anyway. No, we can hear you. All right, awesome. Okay, so let's- No, you let's... have problems. Yeah. All right. So what's generative AI? Um, it's, I, I wouldn't be surprised that we have all heard about generative AI, uh, if, even if not generative AI. The word ChatGPT has been around for over a year. I think uh, ChatGPT became one year, like a few days ago. And uh, no, uh, I think, uh, EOS and tech, you may want to respond to that. Do I enable, do I allow private recording? I think that should be fine. Okay. So, yeah. So we are familiar with ChatGPT at least, but there are a number of other uh, generative AI projects out there. Um, Google is working very hard to create their own technologies around generative AI. Um, Amazon is doing its bits around generative AI. Microsoft is essentially working with OpenAI, the, the owners of, uh, of ChatGPT, to build their own platforms around generative AI. Uh, a whole number of organizations are trying to see how they can leverage generative AI and even be at the front of it in terms of doing business. Uh, but what, what really is this technology? It's essentially about, um, it's, it's a new you know, way to look at uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, artificial intelligence has been with us for a very long time, but we all we always see it as a technology Okay. Yeah, so we've always looked at artificial intelligence like something out of this world, something that is reserved to, you know, very special people, extremely talented people. But essentially, we are all talented in our own ways. And what generative AI is doing essentially is to uh, enable us to express our talent in this very special way. It's essentially giving us power as individuals to bring out the best of us, uh, leveraging technologies that has not been within our reach before. So it f essentially focuses on creation and innovation. It's about generating new new content uh, from, you know, it's, it, it has like access to, let, I'm just going to, you know, make this conversation, uh, uh, I, I'll take it at a level that we can all relate to it. We don't want to boss with, you know, very technical, 
technical terms. So we can think about generative AI as something that helps you know generate new ideas, new content, uh, new innovation from uh, we can imagine that it has access to uh, like global knowledge. The goal is that it will have access to global knowledge. Of course, for now, it doesn't have access to all knowledge everywhere, but there is a process called training uh, where these uh, humongous technologies are trained with data, with information that is out there. And that training process continues. And the more it's trained, the better it is, and the better is able to help us in anything we want to, to do or to, to generate. From the word generative AI, it's all about generating things. So it's using its own knowledge to create new things for us. Um, you can imagine, uh, you know, uh, a, maybe a poet writing a very nice poem, or maybe someone who is a graphics designer, you know, generating very beautiful uh, uh, artwork for us. Now imagine that you are able to do that by yourself, just instructing your computer to say, generate a poem for me, generate an image for me on any, you know, form of idea that you have, or a whole lot of other complex, you know, things that we can imagine that before now we are not able to, to to put out, but now we have our computer, our phones, who are equipped with these new technologies, and they are able to put out our thought for us in a very creative, creative way. So, um, moving on. Today's conversation, we are going to focus on understanding generative AI, uh, benefits of generative AI and how to augment our skills to, to be able to leverage generative AI in our work. So we start with understanding generative AI. We know, like I mentioned before, there are a whole lot of technical you know, uh, words out there. Uh, we are going to just discuss a little bit because if we don't have any you know, idea about this, uh, how these things work, we may not be able to appreciate fully you know, uh, the opportunities that are available to us. So some of those words that we must have heard about is machine learning. Now, machine learning simply talks about uh, you, uh, your computers learning from data or, you know, processes that you provide to it, and it's then able to take actions on its own. You know, he can make decisions based on data that it has learned from. And then even, you know, very smarter ones are able to even learn from itself, uh, even retrain itself, and the process is becoming continuous. So they are becoming way smarter. So essentially, when you hear about machine learning, we are simply talking about computers learning from data and being able to make decisions from, from, from those data. Uh, another word that's being held there would be neural networks. And that is essentially what you know, these technologies are based upon. Uh, from the word neural network, we are speaking about a uh, network of computing uh, resources in the form of the brain. So these uh, neural network technologies are essentially uh, inspired by how you know, neuroscientists understand the brain to work. The brain works by a, you know, a, a humongous network of nerves. And then they apply the same, uh, the same idea in computing to network you know, uh, computers at some incredible, you know, to create an incredible kind of network of computers that work together to solve problems. Uh, in the best of network we used to have would be something like the internet, where my computer can talk to your computer wherever you put it. So far, we can establish a, a connection over the internet. But the, the neural network is way more advanced uh, form of network in which information is processed simultaneously across multiple systems in a, in a fashion that is pre, that we didn't have before. Um, <clears throat> Another, some other words that are very close to us that we've heard about would be things like DALI. DALI is a technology from OpenAI for generating images. We will see into that a little bit in a bit. Um, 
Yeah. So if you are using that E, for example, you can say, you, you can tell it and say, generate for me a two-headed flamingo plain chest. Imagine how abstract that kind of instruction is. And it's going to understand that and generate an image that looks like, like that. It's quite fascinating. There are more things coming up in that in that regard. Um, and there are people, there are a generative AI programs that are generating videos now. We may have seen some video clips that are created with generative AI. You can imagine what will be happening in say 10 years from now, the kind of content that people will be, you know, creating with these technologies. GPT uh, essentially is, uh, it's, it's also created by OpenAI. The one we are familiar with is ChatGPT. Now we even have what they refer to as GPT, where you are able to create your own GPT, you know, and then it can do different things as you would like it to do. GPT is essentially create tests. Uh, when embedded with other tools, they can also do other things, but essentially it takes instruction in natural language. The natural language is just me speaking plain English and the computer can pick that up understand what I want to do and, you know, uh, perform that instruction. In previously, we write programs to communicate with computers, but uh, uh, and programs are written in specific programming languages. Uh, good enough, people like Hughes and Tech have been, you know, trying to take people to a higher level without writing codes and technologies like generative AI is going to really accelerate that effort because people can now create incredible stuff just speaking, you know, plain English to, to their computers. But how does these all things work? Um, essentially, uh, we, are, we are familiar with the concept of you give computer, what you give to computer is what you gives back to you, but uh, computers actually, you know, do a whole lot of uh, processing on the information we give to it. And a technology like uh, generative AI um, does not just process the information, it understands what you want to do. It has access to a humongous level of information that will help it to carry out that function. And it's going to give you an output, but then, you are able to refine that, that what you have received and provide it with a feedback and say, adjust this in a way. And then it goes back and adjusts that, that output again. And that loop continue, continues uh, um, as for as long as you desire until you are satisfied with the, with the final output. Uh, we can imagine the idea of GPT or even generative AI like a, a little child. Uh, some people claim that a child is born without without information in his brain. Maybe that is real. Maybe it's not. I'm, I, I don't know. But these GPTs are not born with nothing in their head. Uh, they are already pre-trained with you know, the kind of data that is actually difficult to imagine because it's quite large. Okay, and then he has all that in his what they call foundational knowledge. So that child has what is called foundational knowledge, but the foundational knowledge does not address exactly what I, I am looking for. You know, as let's say I want to use it for something. So it means that I need to tell it what I want. I need to provide it additional data on what I want. And then the child may mumble and you know come up with something that looks like what I still want. But then I give the child more feedback. I train the child better. And then it becomes smarter. And it grows and is able to become a companion in performing you know, the task that I, that I set to do. So this is the same concept we can look at. Look at you uh, uh, with generative AI, you can now have different kind of people uh, or children, for example, who can do great stuff, highly skilled, extremely knowledgeable, but then you can still train them to perform actions the way that you, you desire, okay? So like I mentioned before, there are no good things that does not have his own bad sides or 
challenges or risks. So the same applies to generative AI. And whenever we discuss generative AI, we shouldn't um, we should make efforts to discuss the challenges that and risk that 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 comes with it. The first main challenge would be um, resources. I read a few days ago that for you to generate an image with uh, with generative AI to generate just one image, the power resources required uh, will be enough to charge an iPhone from zero to 100 to generate an image. And it's probably going to generate that image in, uh, in less than, maybe less than a few, few minutes. It's going to generate that image in, in, in a few seconds, actually. And within that few seconds, it has consumed the same energy that will be required to charge an iPhone from zero to 100. Uh, imagine we have a thousand people generating these images for different purposes, and that's going to require, you know, the, the kind of power that the world, you know, uh, may not really be ready for. But it's, but that also provides a new opportunity for people who would invest in such uh, technologies. Um, so the resources is a major challenge for, for generative AI. Another thing to look at is ethics. Because this uh, technology can generate anything and you can tune it to generate the information uh, or content the way you desire with your own intentions, uh, it's also likely for people to use it to create uh, content that may not be actually factual, and they may make it look like it's actually uh, factual. So imagine you create a video about uh, the president saying something, which is going to look very real, but he didn't actually say it. So the concept of deep fakes come into play. So but uh, I w people are also walking around. That also provides another opportunity. There are people who have made career in in uh, AI ethics, and it's also flourishing. So people are working on that as well. Privacy is another challenge uh, because this AI, generative AI, you know, deals with knowledge, and you have to provide knowledge for it to to respond to give you you know a useful output. Uh, it, if you're not careful, you may provide it information that are sensitive. Mm -hmm. And then that may, you know, lead to, you know, maybe imagine that you provide it with your trade oh, secret. And then it took your trade secret, make it part of his own financial knowledge. And it's able to, is, uh... and it's able to then, uh... it's able to then provide that information to other people. You can, that's, that's so we need to be careful when using generative AI to be sure that we are not compromising, you know, uh, uh, our privacy. Biases is another thing. Um, and this simply states that, um, let's say I am somebody who is, uh, uh, let's say I'm very biased in terms of gender. Maybe I have gender biases. I have preferences for female, uh, uh, for male workers in my industry, for example. And I provided the information that is used to train my, uh, my foundational models. Uh, chances are the models may begin to behave like me. So it may be bringing out my biases in its, in its work. So uh, let's say you say, create for me an image of a very nice looking person. If I'm a black person and I've provided data about black people, you know, significantly, it's probably going to generate an image of a very fine black person. Uh, and same would apply uh, if if the data it was trained on was about white people. So that kind of biases exists. But people are making efforts to be sure that there is a balance in the kind of information that we are using to train these models to be sure that such biases are mitigated. Okay, so those four are challenges and risks. We need to, to pay attention to, to them in, in our work and see how we, we can navigate them, okay? Okay, so, okay. Yeah, 
What are the capabilities of generative AI? We already know that it can generate text. So um, I want to believe most of us have already used uh, ChatGPT and we have been creating you know, letters, we've been creating articles, uh, maybe even presentations and what's made using uh, ChatGPT. So essentially it does that. You can also create videos. You know, you can just describe, uh, you know, the kind of video that that you desire, and it's able to create it for you. Okay, um, it can create images. Um, then it can also generate codes. It can do a whole lot of things, but these are, uh, you know, the common use cases that people have quite familiar with. Um. So what are the benefits of generative AI? Essentially, it boosts creativity and efficiency. Imagine that you, it, it looks as if you have a personal assistant that is incredibly smart. And then in anything you want to do, you can delegate work to your assistant and is able to deliver efficiently. Um, it's used across multiple industries, in fact, every industry is struggling to get a hang of it and find the best use cases within uh, the, that industry. In education, people are working hard to see how they can you know, leverage it in teaching, in creating curriculums and, and things like that. We have also worked extensively in that area. In journalism, people are you know, creating initial reports, uh, analyzing peer reports and, and stuff like that. So. The, the the benefits are quite you know um, expansive and because we are speaking about career in this conversation we we'll quickly go through some areas some career uh, some careers where uh, generative AI can can be leveraged immediately and anybody can do that with just a little bit of skills that doesn't require coding essentially the skills, is basically speaking better English, communicating better, because this, at this stage, what we do really is to discuss with our assistants in terms of, in the name of generative AI, and it's going to help us do whatever we want to do. But communication is key. How do we communicate? That's the skill that we, you know, essentially would need to have. So for somebody in customer support, uh, you are able to leverage historical data and get quicker responses to common customer query. So all your consultations and, and systems like Salesforce, for example, they're also integrating AI. And imagine all the cases that you have uh, logged and now you have an intelligent assistant that can understand all those cases that customers have, uh, customers have put in and is able to generate responses to them even before they have problem now, self, you will be able to give you solution. So that's a kind of advantage that you can take out, you can, you can, you know, leverage as a customer support person. Of course, you don't have to, you know, have access to Salesforce and this conversation, we are going to show us how we can do a whole lot of things with, you know, what is available to every one of us today. Okay. So in marketing, you can brainstorm campaign ideas. In fact, one of the most you know fascinating things that that generative AI can do for us is generating idea. Just have the thoughts and be able to express what you desire, and you would actually be fascinated the kind of um, of result that is going to give. So, also you can analyze customer feedback and things like that. You know, imagine that you you have you have run run a Instagram campaign, for example, and you have a gamut of feedback from from you know your customers, or maybe you have some from Facebook or LinkedIn or wherever, and you have all of these logged in a spreadsheet, and you want to make sense of it, and you just upload that spreadsheet and you ask, uh, you ask whichever tool you are using, whichever generative AI tool you are using, say ChatGPT, and you begin to query it. You begin to ask it for trends. You can ask, plot me a graph that shows how what time people are engaging. What should I do? You know, a whole lot of things that you can 
come up with so far you have the data and you're able to provide it to it then it goes to work and is able to help you to answer any kind of question that you may have that's some you know um some uh, expertise that you may have to pay for if you if you are not trained in analyzing such information even if you are trained in analyzing data you may not be trained as a marketer you may not be trained in brand communication and things like that but this AI technologies have those inherent, you know, knowledge, and they are able to deliver. You only need to tell it that act as so 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 act as a brand advisor, for example. Look at my data and tell me something, and it's going to do it fine. Okay. Uh, people in supply chain can also uh, manage a historical sales market trends. They are able to, you know. Yeah, consults about risk, uh, contingency planning, and things like that. So far, the data is available. You are able to do that. And if, if you if you are the supply chain manager and you are able to do all of this way faster, uh, if you are working with a big organization, you probably have your ERPs that can do a whole lot of stuff for you. But imagine you don't have access to to those and even if you do you are able to even do things faster smarter and you're able to deliver on on your work much more uh, efficiently uh, as a project manager too you can manage your project timelines and tasks using you know generative ai ability to understand the requirements uh, generate a structured plan for you uh, and you can be updating that plan as the work is progressing. And then it's also be guiding you and be providing you with, you know, further uh, information that you will be that will be useful to you. Or let's say in generating reports. So let's say uh, you should be delivering reports on a maybe weekly basis. And with generative AI, you may be able to deliver your reports like every every day. And imagine how impressed the stakeholders would be if you are able to give them, you know, timely feedback or or, or report or updates on the project. Okay, that's going to like improve your communication significantly, stakeholder communication significantly. Uh, data scientists, these are the people who actually live and sleep with generative AI. And it, like I've said from time to time, the the, this technology relies heavily on data. So beyond data scientists, you know, working on the data that goes into generative AI, they can also leverage generative AI in their own work. Uh, let's say you even want, you know, hypothetical scenario, you need 1 million records to do some hypothetical uh, or research, for example, you are able to generate those data. You know, you just describe the kind of data you want, you're able to generate it and you are able to, carry out your visualization or, or, or um, um, uh, using synthetic synthetic data for whatever you you wish to, to do. And a whole lot of things, you can even upload your own data. Let's say you, um, you have some data on market research, for, for example, and you're able to up, upload that. You can generate your graphs. Um, you can generate your charts, you can compare data, you can do a whole lot of things that you know, would require some extensive data uh, science knowledge. You can now do those things very quickly and you can focus on you know, inf uh, informing, uh, op uh, forming opinions, which is what really bring value to the, to the work that you do and leave the heavy lifting to AI to help, to help you with. IT people uh, are also able to implement generative AI systems in maybe app desk. Uh, if you provide, you know, the the knowledge base of your of your you know of your environment to generative AI, then you can have an AI assistant that can you know speak to your staff. So when staff have issue, uh, before they come to IT, they can actually consult your AI IT assistant and even solve the problems to some extent. And when required, they then come to IT. So you can troubleshoot, resolve common technical issues without necessarily you know, uh, overwhelming the IT, IT, IT people. Um, 
Yeah, there are a whole lot of other things that can be done. You can generate incident, re incident response plan. You can, you know, you can do uh, network analysis. Let's say you have a system that is collecting logs within your environment. You can provide this to generative AI and begin to query it further and ask questions and even seek for solution. How do we resolve this and, and all of that? Okay, um, I've spoken about different uh, you know, careers that can leverage generative AI. At this point, I would like to speak about uh, uh, people within my own space. I'm a developer. So how am we you know, taking advantage of, uh, of generative AI in our work? Uh, personally, you know, I've, uh, you, you, I'm able to write, I, I'm going to speak as, somebody who have used this to, to some extent and how it has impacted me. Now I'm able to write uh, programs in many languages, which before now, uh, if you can write efficiently in one programming language, say Java, for example, now we will say you are really good. Maybe you can also write in Python. I would say, oh, wow, you are really, really good. But now you can actually write you know, programs in any language whatsoever. Okay, and all you need is your background experience as a developer. Um, let me just quickly show us an example of how that works. So I'm going to I'm going to open this simple code, which anybody can actually write. It's a it's a program to to sort records. So let's say I have one to 10, uh, one to 100 different numbers, and I want to sort it. So anybody can write this is instruction. This is basic uh, pseudocode. It's not actually a program, but it's an instruction on how I want the, uh, uh, this function to be performed. And that's essentially what a, programming, a programmer will be doing going forward. So you're only going to know what you want to do and then you can actually has uh, uh, chat GPT, for example, to write the program for you. Now, I want to try what I have written. And uh, it's going to, okay, it's using, I'm using chat GPT-4. I don't intend to use chat GPT-4, but let's see what it's going to come up with. Okay, chat GPT-4 is a bit more advanced. It can do way more than, than, I, than, than you know, uh, the previous versions. So what this code is going to do, like this is not a programming language. This is close to English language, but it's structured in a, in a it's written in a structured manner. Okay, it's not, a, it's, not, it's not a programming language, but he understood what I want to do. And this, logic is actually very essential when you are working with generative AI. If you are able to, you know, provide your instruction in a very detailed, structured manner, you, you, you are better guaranteed of, of, of good results. So what I'm saying you should do here is essentially generate uh, 10, 10 numbers between one and 10 randomly, and then sort the other, uh, the numbers in, in increasing format. Now, let's say I've never been a programmer and I am able to write an instruction that can do this. Then I can generate codes. I can generate a, a programming code to do that. And then I can use it in my, in my, in my project, okay? So I'm putting back, this is ChatGPT uh, 3.5, which, okay, it did the same thing. And I'm going to say, generate a Python programming, a Python code for, the, for this, a Python code for this. Okay, so this is the Python, you know, implementation of, this instruction that I have here. Okay, uh, imagine I have never written Java before and I say, okay, uh, generate it in Java. Generate it in Java.
Okay, this is the Java implementation of that. Let's say generate it in Golang. That is a language I've never written before. Generate. Okay, so like I said, Golang is a language that I've never written before. Now, if I'm going for an interview, for example, and they're asking me, can you write a program in Golang? I think my answer would be yes, because I know how to structure uh, instructions that can work in a, co in a program. And then I know I can always use ChatGPT to generate the code and it's going to work e e extremely well. So that's one way that I've personally taken advantage of, of uh, ChatGPT uh, or, or generative AI as a software engineer. Now, another thing, is you can create um, HTML or CSS from graphic designs. In the realm of, of application development, a number of us may be familiar with this concept where you have uh, somebody who is great at you know, creating uh, visual images and stuff. We call them, uh, where some, you may call them graphic designer, some, you who have gone ahead to do more, we call them user experience, user interface, user experience professionals. You know, I'm sure EOS and tech have trained a has trained a number of people in that. Now, this is a real life project where somebody, you know, this a graphics designer did this. Uh, normally, I'm um, should be this is this tool is called Figma. Normally, I should be able to just pick the code from here and use it in the project. But the person who designed this is not in any way a web developer at all. He's a basic uh, uh, graphic designer. So he has not used the elements that I'm able to use uh, as, as they are in my, in my program. So it means that I will have to rewrite a whole lot of things and then follow the design and all that. That's a whole lot of, of headache. And so what will I do? I just do a screenshot of this screen, okay? I do a screenshot, go to my chat GPT and say, uh, sorry. Mm. Okay, say generate the uh, HTML and CSS. This HTML and CSS are essentially the front end, you know, uh, languages to create any visual representation on the web, web web page for this screen. Okay. So. Uh, this is using AI vision. When people talk about AI can now see or ChatGPT can now see is essentially saying we can give it image and it can understand what is in the image and it's able to, it's able to then, you know, take our instruction. It has looked at this image. Uh, this may not be too good because I didn't quite copy it well, but it's okay. And then it's able to generate the HTML that would match what is on the screen and then follow it with the CSS that would, you know, um, help with the design for the screen. Okay. Now, I'm not going to, I have already done this. So, and this is the output. This is the web page. Anybody can go to this web page and they will see exactly. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, they will see exactly that screen come up. Okay, which is of course with a little bit of tweaks here and there. It's not that I can't do that on my own without using uh, AI assistance, but that is definitely going to take me more time. And you know, why do I need to spend that time if I can easily, easily you know, use ChatGPT to help me out? Okay, so. If you're a developer or a web developer or something like that, you can definitely appreciate how 
you know, that has helped uh, greatly. Another thing that I do is, okay, I'm not a designer. I don't really like designing things. So I can say, generate for me what a mobile interface for, you know, uh, a, a, a uh, shopping cart should look like or a e-commerce website. Generate a mobile responsive interface for, so it's going to generate that for me. And then I can then go further and say, generate the code. Once I'm happy with the with the interface it created, then I can go further and say, generate the code. And I can take that and go use in my in my application. Yes, people talk about um, the developers are going to be eliminated when AI becomes too good that it can create any application for people. I don't think we are, well, maybe we will, but at the moment, we are not really going to have something like that. What we are going to have are people who are able to leverage AI in development work, and they are able to do things, you know, way way faster and more in a very in more efficient efficient way. So personally, what am I doing? Knowing that this is going to happen, uh, it's enough to compete with the very young smart guys coming up. Now you have AI. Uh, assistants writing codes to compete with. So what, what am I doing personally? So I would like, you know, uh, I would not want to be displaced by AI. Neither would I want to be, you know, displaced by the younger folks. But then I can leverage AI to improve what I do and become uh, more relevant. And how am I doing that personally? I'm designing processes that augment uh, the application development lifecycle with generative AI from um creating user stories from your backlog requirement gathering uh testing automation and all of that we can have a high do a whole lot of work in that life cycle and if you are the one who can help your organization put that process in place and you are delivering solutions faster and better then you are going to be relevant it may reduce your the the amount of code you are writing the number nines of code you are writing may be reducing because you are now leveraging ai to do a whole lot of heavy lifting for you but yet you would be very relevant because you are able to deliver more value to the business and I'm also creating tools that will make it even easier for people uh, and businesses to create their AI, AI solutions. Uh, before now, we have uh, uh, the chat GPT 3.5, and then we are, you are quite limited in what you can do. Now you have uh, chat GPT 4 and beyond, and the technologies are getting better. Microsoft is investing, you know, in tools that help people to do to do things also. And then I feel, okay, that's an area where I can also help. Uh, those people are going to charge you a whole lot. And today you are able to create uh, applications using my, my technologies. And those are things that I am also doing to uh, contribute in this uh, um, terrain. Okay, so what have I done? Um, the the platform called GPT Desk is a place where you are able to create your own AI apps without writing any code, and we are going to see that you know uh, shortly. Um, I created the Ammonist, which is uh, uh, like a AI mediator that like bringing the third party into your conversation to help you you know streamline the conversation and you know come to a resolution faster i created micro tutor which is a learning platform that leverages ai to teach to generate learning contents and all of that for professionals and learners i also i also worked on uh, fade up which is a dedicated christian you know um support providing you know, guidance, spiritual encouragement, spiritual guidance, counseling to, to people, you know, uh, based on Christian faith. So these are all experimental projects. Um, and these are things that, you know, anybody can begin to work with and build their own things. So these are other ways that you can enhance yourself. So one way is to, uh, you know, enhance the work that you do 
using generative AI, become better professional, become smarter, deliver more value to your business. Another way is you can also create solutions that people would subscribe to or people would pay to use. Okay, that's another way you can create value or even you know uh, take advantage of generative AI. Another way to take advantage of Generative AI is you can also sell prompt scripts. Uh, prompt scripts are instructions that you give to generative AI systems that would give um, you know responses uh, or to perform a set of instruction. So this one I have on the screen is just an example of something that somebody created. I did not create this one. Somebody created it. I saw it in the store. Um, this person would probably not spend. I don't even know what this thing does. But whatever he does, I don't believe he would have spent more than two nights to create it. And as at the time I took this screenshot, this uh, script has been in the store for just three, three weeks. And it has already sold uh, 742 uh, items. You know, at $9.99, if you calculate that in Naira, that would be like 7 million Naira in three weeks of sale. You know, not many people have the kind of product that can sell, you know, uh, and this is not Yahoo Yahoo, for example. I had this, not many people have that kind of gener uh, revenue in three weeks. So, and this person is not in any way different from any one of us. You can begin to learn how to write these scripts and you can begin to commercialize your scripts if you wish. Or let's say you work in an organization that is already adopting generative AI extensively. You can also begin to, you know, add value to your colleagues, add value to the processes in your business, uh, you know, writing, you know, better uh, instructions. Let me not use the word script because that sounds like technology. Better instructions for generative AI. And there are learning, you know, uh, tools and materials that can help you get started to start doing that. Okay. Um, why should we augment our skills with AI? Uh, I would want to ask that question and say, why should we not? You know, because it's not something that I think we can actually afford not to do. Uh, a research by Harvard at Boston Consulting Group showed that uh, AI assistant consultants completed their tasks 25% faster and accomplished 12% more tasks and produced work uh, that are 40% higher in quality than people who are not using AI to assist themselves. Now, this, of course, BCG is one of the biggest consulting firms in the world. You can imagine that they have some of the smartest, you know, people in their employ. And if these people are already, you know, uh, differentiating themselves, I mean, uh, consultant to consultant now, differentiating themselves using uh, AI tools to up upskill and, you know, upgrade the level of work that they do, then, uh, it means that there is so much value in that in 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 generative AI for us. Uh, Microsoft did an analysis uh, where they examined the use of GitHub AI Copilot. That's a a tool that can help a developer in writing their code. So as you are programming as a developer, <coughs> uh, the Copilot tool is is also predicting what you should type next generating more code for you, accessing the code that you are writing and all that. It's like having a, a, a co-programmer. There is a concept in programming called peer, peer programming. So this can actually eliminate the use for a pair and then you can leverage AI as your pair. And the results showed that programmers that are leveraging Copilot are working at 55% uh, you know, uh, uh, faster rates they are delivering their codes 55% faster than those who are not. So this, I saw this um, article on Business Insider actually yesterday that says the world is splitting between those who, are, who use ChatGPT to get better and smarter and richer and everyone else. And that's a fact. Um, people have started making money. People are already, you know, uh, uh, getting promotions at work. Someone... Uh, yeah. people are also changing jobs already. There are people who are reaching out to those that are, you know, <clears throat> becoming, you know, evidently better 
at what they do uh, just because they are leveraging uh, generative AI. They have not gone on any essential, uh, 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 any uh, form of uh, uh, advanced training. All they have done is leverage, you know, chat GPT that is available to everybody in what they do and they are becoming smarter. And when you are smarter, you command more value and then ultimately it brings more money. Okay, so moving on, uh, how do we get to augment our skills? There are different levels to this. Uh, since we at EOS uh, and Tech focus more on low code, no code to low code, you know, skill sets, people at the beginner level should be able to get started using AI, building AI solutions, you know, without writing code already. There are uh, uh, tutorials and lessons, Google AI education, Intel AI for citizens, IBM AI for professional certificate, and all that for people who want to get started at different, you know, uh, levels of entry. For intermediate level, you are getting deeper want to work on deep learning specialization, Google machine learning with TensorFlow, uh, Google advanced machine learning with TensorFlow, then you are getting even better at advanced level. You have NVIDIA. NVIDIA produces uh, the chips that generative AI uh, uh, technologies run on, and they are also you know, producing some resources for generative AI, and they are also training as well. And then there are professional certificate in computer vision, you know, from uh, University of Washington. So these are uh, different levels. And at any level at all, you may also be interested in Microsoft certificates for Azure AI fundamentals, uh, Google professional machine learning engineer, AWS machine learning, and all of that. Yeah, I do not want to dissuade us to say, oh, these are a bit technical, no. Uh, we can begin our journey from the beginner level and right away, we would be starting with the low, no code uh, uh, part of things. And in this, and we are going to demonstrate how to do that. And um, in this demonstration, we are going to create some things. And when you leave this webinar this night, you are also able to start creating you know, your own AI solutions, and that's the goal. So um, there are a few ways that you can get started, okay? If you have access to ChatGPT Enterprise, maybe your business has subscribed to ChatGPT Enterprise, you may be able to create your your AI, your GPTs or your AI solutions directly on, on, on uh, ChatGPT, okay? If you also have, if you are subscribed to ChatGPT Plus, and that costs uh, twenty dollars per month, as as at now. So you are also able to create your, uh, your uh, AI solutions and share with people. Uh, but if you don't have access to those, yeah, that's why I've created the GPT Desk, which is available at gptdemo.web.hub that you can immediately, you know, start using for free to create your solution. Uh, it's the, the output is practically the same as what you will get if you created with uh, OpenAI tools. Uh, the only difference is you are not going to pay to, to use this, okay? All right, so here we go. Uh, the first thing we want to create is a performance review assistant. And you can imagine that you, uh, many of us are professionals and we don't, uh, when some have the luxury of having HR giving them feedback every every week, maybe every month, maybe some once in a year. But what if you want to assess yourself on a daily basis and you have your KPIs? Okay. So what we want to do, um, let me go to here. Yeah. So I want to do a performance evaluator for an HR officer. So this HR officer has a set of KPIs that has been defined by his HR. Okay, so this is a, this is just hypothetical. It's just something I generated. Your KPI would be different from this, but you can, let's just use this as an example. So this is HR officer KPI. Uh, the KPI 
has uh, employee satisfaction, it has a weight of 30%, talent ac acquisition has a weight of 10, etc, etc, etc. Okay, <clears throat> and ratings are defined this way. Okay, if you significantly exceed the expectation, it gives you 90 to 100. You know, we are familiar with this. So this is your KPI and your rating, okay? So, and then you want to create uh, something to help evaluate you from time to time, or maybe you want to evaluate your staff, okay? Okay, so I go to GPT, so uh, let me, Okay, so at gptdemo.web.app. We have some solutions there already, something around the medical, family medical desk, blah, 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 blah. But what I want to do now is I want to create a solution. So, and then I would go to build application. So I have some things here. But this is my own console, private to me. When you go on to GPT Desk or at gptdemo.web.hub, you also have your own developer console. Everything you create is private to you, except you decide to, to share it. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to create an application. I click on application. What's the ID? Performance uh, Manager. Performance mm, Review. Uh, manager, yeah, let's call it performance manager. Okay. <clears throat> okay, what do I want to call the agent name when he's chatting with me? Uh, uh, performance PM, P manager. Let's just call it something fancy. P manager, okay. Uh, then give you the development team. This one maybe is HR Labs. Maybe that's what you do. Uh, evaluate HR officer. The performance of HR officer. Evaluate the performance of HR officer. Okay. So I'll create it. And then immediately it takes me to the lab, uh, to the console for this application, to the settings. And all I need to do really is to provide it the instruction. Uh, the instruction is what well, is described as action prompt so that we don't waste time. I already have that uh, written down here. Okay, so this is the and you can see it's basic English. Uh, okay, it's basic English that I've written here. I only told it what to do. Okay, I just tell it you're an employee performance reviewer. I will provide you with a narration of my performance and I want you to conduct a review. You will perform the review based on the KPI and rating scale you have been provided for HR officer. Do your best to extract the metrics from the narration. If multiple narrations are provided, uh, provide reviews for each staff, okay? Yeah, this is me giving instruction to my assistant. Let's think of it that way. And this assistant is so knowledgeable and it will always do exactly what I asked it to do. Okay, so how do I want it to, to, to behave apart from you know, knowing what I want it to do. This is what is defined under contextual guideline. Okay. And there I say, start by asking for the narration for my performance. So when we start, it's going to ask, tell me about your performance. And then I will just describe what I have done, maybe for the week. And after receiving the narration, provide the rating, the weighted score for each KPI and the rationale for your rating in a tabular format. Include the overall score and rating. Be sure to provide present the result in a tabular format. Okay, that's just double emphasizing that I would want it in a tabular format. Okay, so what template do I want to use for this purpose? I just leave it at default and uh, that will be that. Okay. 
Yeah, the next thing is it needs to know uh, about the KPI, right? Which we have defined and all I need to do is get the KPI in it, okay? Oops. Okay, this is the KPI. Okay, so yeah, the application is done. Uh, okay, one more thing. Uh, the chart is limited to 200, but because the narration will be much larger, um, much larger, I've increased, I want to increase it to 2000, so it can take 2000 characters, okay. Okay, so that's it. And then I would launch this app now. Okay, and within the few seconds of that we spent, you have already created your own, you know, <clears throat> AI app. And then it's asking me for the narration. Please provide the narration for your performance of an HR as an HR officer. Okay. <clears throat> so I have some scenarios here that I would want to test. Um Okay, so, okay, so uh, say this person. Okay, so I would come here, put the narration, then you will go to work and use the KPI to analyze this narration and come up with a, with a you know, review of, this Tommy Wade for fellow. Okay, he's typing the result now, and in a moment, it would give us. Okay, so the result is back. Well, it didn't take my instruction to do it in a tabular format, but I can tell it again. But this is what it looks like. So let let's let me. Tell it to give me the tabular format. Okay, present the results in a tabular format. Okay, so now this is what it believes my performance is uh, based on. And he's saying I did not meet expectation. Okay, so that's just an example. So you can, if you know your KPI at work, you can create your own personal, you know, evaluator, give it the KPI, and every week, for example, you can describe how you have performed, and it's going to rate you. And if at the end of the year your manager rates you something different, you may want to take it up and say, no, I have my own personal yeah, uh, 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 performance reviewer that, that feels differently. You know, just that's just kidding. But yeah, that's just something that you can create. Okay, let's go back. Um, okay, the next thing we can look at is uh, an AI tutor. How, do, how can we create an AI tutor? Okay. Um, for this, we'll be leveraging, I have, I want to create a tutor for prompt, prompt, uh, prompt design, something that can teach us how to write good prompts. Okay, and I don't have more than the guideline, the guideline for, for this. And the guideline simply says, uh, these are understanding the task. This is a prompt design learning guide understanding the task, clarity and precision, context and detail, interactive approach, ethical considerations, creativity and exploration, feedback and adjustment, staying informed, you know. Now, I'm going to provide this to my AI tutor and it can create a full learning curriculum in a conversational manner and teach and even test uh, the, the user's uh, understanding. So I go back here, yeah, and this is this is really going to be fast. I just call it prompt tutor, prompt tutor, prompt uh, tutor, prompt design. 
prompt tutor development team ai labs description prompt design learning nothing more than that okay create it then for this i would go to the model instruction i don't want to provide it any prompt or any guideline because we already we have already created a learning template and that template would define the prompt the guideline and all of that to suit how a learning uh, program should be delivered by ai yes i also because i only have the guideline i want to expand with foundational knowledge and then i would provide the uh prompt design guideline next yeah i don't that would be all and then i can launch this app now okay so uh he said he's telling me he's my prompt instructor Uh, let me restart it. Okay, better. Okay, it's telling me I'm prompt tutor, and this is the course outline. Let's begin. Please share your prior, prior understanding of the topic. Okay, let's say I don't know anything. I don't know about prompt design. Okay, and what he's going to do is it would adapt the course in a way that suits somebody who had no prior knowledge. If I said I had the prior knowledge, he's also going to assess my knowledge and he's going to adapt that and you know uh, teach me at that level. Now, he's just going to go on, you know, this is like learning by chatting. It's like me chatting with my teacher and he's going to teach me these courses from uh one to eight uh and also tests you know conduct a brief test to see how i have performed we don't have time to go through that but yeah for the purpose of this training one thing i will also do is i'm going to activate this so if you go to if you go to uh the uh, gpt demo web dot web dot app if you go to the development store because i've activated it it will be available it will be available for you here. So you can actually do your uh, prompt design e-learning right away uh, from, from there. Okay, that's that's another thing that we have created. Now, within a few, few minutes, we have created two apps. Of course, we can go on and go on and go on, but there is one I'm really interested in creating, the last one I'll create. I plan to do this, oh, okay, sorry. I would like to also show us how you can, you know, uh, create an app just by chatting. Okay. Previously, I have created these apps by providing the instruction that I've written before. What if I can just chat with it and create, you know, uh, my app? So on our micro tutor platform, we've created a uh, a series of learning generators. And all you need to do is chat with it and create your, your learning material. Okay, so you come here and it's asking you, um, your micro, micro tutor publisher, what role uh, do I want to create micro learning for? Okay, so what this is going to, what this particular hub does is to generate learning that targets uh, professionals. So this will be useful to people in learning and development, for example. Let's say the, the role I want to develop learning for now is IT support, for example. Okay, so I'm answering it, that is IT support. So what it would do is it will create, you know, a number of uh, job functions for IT support and suggest what they should learn uh, as an IT support person, if I'm fine with all of these, I would just say proceed. If I want to make adjustment, I would tell it to make adjustment. Well, I'm, I'm pretty cool with this. So I would say, this is fine. I'm ready to deploy. This is fine. I am ready. 
to deploy. Okay, so it's suggesting some, you know, when we were creating uh, using the console, these are some information we were providing, but this is a conversational app builder and it's going to suggest some things to you. You can change it. Uh, in this case, I'm going to accept all of this. I'm okay with the recommended. Okay, it's trying to reconfirm that this is exactly what I will use. And I said, okay. 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 Why this wait? We'll come back to it. But essentially, what it's going to do when it's done is it would have deployed the app. It will be available. It will have a link, and then we would be able to you know, uh, take the course just like the previous ones. Okay. Now, the last thing I want to show is a family finance advisor. This one is quite interesting because I think almost everybody would, you know, relate with what this particular app would do. And what it's going to do is, is an expert in budgeting, smart shopping, meal planning, and, and stuff like that. So, I'll go to the demo. Um, let me check that I don't have connectivity issue. Okay. Okay, so now I want to create. Um, family finance and family CFO. Family Finance Advisor. Okay, the GPT name is Family CFO. Development name is, uh, let me just put my name. Let me want to focus. Okay, um, app with Family. Family financial matters, family. Okay. Okay, for the family CFO also, I have created, um, yeah. So I have this set up here. So this is the prompt and all he's going to do is, he's going to look at the history, uh, the family's historical um, spending. And then he will use that to guide on, you know, anything they, they ask it. Okay. Still default template. Now, where is the the uh, family history uh, spending history? Is essentially like scanning your transaction slips. You know, just some small stuff. You know, from Passmart Mall, you bought some things. These are the prices. From Shop Nice, you bought some things. These are the prices. It can be more than this. You can update it from time to time. So. I'm going to provide it to it as knowledge. 
Um, family CFO grocery Nigerian, okay. Okay, I think that should be all. Uh, let's say, let me take this to 2000 characters just to be sure. Uh, okay, apply changes, then launch. Our family CFO is ready. And then he's asking me, would you like me to generate a meal plan for the week based on your gro grocery shopping history? Yes, that's what I would like to do. Generate, yes, generate a meal plan for the week. Okay, so this is what it feels based on, you know, our shopping history. This is what it feels we would eat for Monday, breakfast, lunch, dinner, blah, 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 blah. This can help some of our wives and husbands that are into kitchen stuff. And then also help us to minimize, you know, the, the financial discussion that can be challenging to have sometimes. Okay, so what I want to do next is create a shopping list for this, okay? Um, create a shopping list for the meal plan for a family of five. Okay, that's for it to know the quantities of things to buy and things like that. Okay, so what it's doing is, it's looking into the history of our shopping. It knows the shops that we've been going to, and then it can pick the best prices. Yeah, so if we, uh, this is definitely going to help to, you know, make the shopping, you know, cheaper because it's using best prices from, from different shops. And I can decide to just go to one if I don't have time. Maybe I want to consider uh, something like transport fee. I think I have a question around that. Uh, okay, I'm not sure I, I wrote it down. Okay, maybe it's in the setup, yeah. I have a question around that. Okay, assuming transport cost to shop nice is 2,000 naira. And the transfer cost to shop mat is 1,000 euro. Where should I go to for this shopping? Okay, let's ask it this question and see how it's going to respond. So this is saying factor in transport costs and let me go to, let's see what it's going to, to say. Okay, so you say given the transportation costs you mentioned, let's compare the cost. If we go to shop nice to buy everything, is going to cost us 36,500 naira. If you go to Passmat to buy everything, including transportation, yep, it's going to cost us uh, 35,000 naira. So it would recommend we go to Passmat to do this shopping. Okay, so this is something anybody can you know do. And we can imagine different ways that this can, that a similar application can help us. Maybe it's in procurement in your office. Uh, maybe it's different kind of budgeting needs that you need somebody to help you, you know, uh, think about all the data you have and make sense of it and give you good recommendation. These are things you would likely want to pay for, uh, but now you can do that by yourself, just knowing what you want to do, and then you are able to <laughs> you are able to build your assistance by yourself, and then you are able to to get the work done. Okay, so that is how far we have come this night. I am very happy to have your questions now. Thank you for listening so far. Thank you for an amazing session, Mr. I thoroughly enjoyed the session. But my question is, please confirm you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you very well. Okay. So my question is, um, so I have this idea and um, I 
put it on the GPT desk to build it out for me. So what's the scalability like? What if I want uh, millions of people to use the application? Uh, Is it visible, feasible, uh, or I would have to uh, extremely, integrate it into uh, other platforms? Extremely visible. And we will be happy to hear that you have 1 million people that want to use it. Of course, at that point, we don't think you want to do something that 1 million people can use without making money from it, right? And yeah, if you get to that level, then it should be mutually beneficial for, for you and for the platform as well. So that's a conversation we can have, but that's not the important thing for us now. We definitely hope we have people that will build something that will reach 1 million people. But what is really important for us at this time is for people to be able to learn the skills that they need, you know, to, to get better at their work or maybe eventually to build things that they can commercialize. But to, to ensure that people are able to learn is the reason we have built the GPT desk for now. Yeah, but for scalability, yeah, the platform itself is running on Google infrastructures and yeah, it's pretty scalable. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, like, I would like for others to ask questions too. Hello, good evening. Thank you good for evening. such a wonderful session. Um, I am truly, truly, truly uh, wowed <laughs> by your ability to create your own chat GPT. Oh. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Um, I have two questions. Um, one, I read somewhere that um, that as much as possible, people should avoid submitting personal details into chat GPT. Do you agree with that? Yes, uh, because we even when we talked about the risk and challenges, you know, we discussed the privacy issues. Okay, so if there is something you don't want, you know, to find out there, uh, you definitely don't want to put it in chat GPT. However, um, you know, I can't, I can't say it's guaranteed that if you use a tool like GPT Desk because it's leveraging APIs and the agreements with ChatGPT is they would not use the data that pass through the APIs, uh, for to train their models. So yeah, such information would not be exposed. But I'm still, that's not, that's not a guarantee. Okay, if there is any information we don't want out there, we probably don't want to put it in any medium that at all. We don't want to send it via WhatsApp. We don't. We probably don't want to have it on our computer because it can be hacked. Yeah. So the same thing applies. If you have information that are quite sensitive, we don't want to to get it out there. We shouldn't put it in ChatGPT. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Okay, my second question is this. Huh? Um. Yes. I. Now understand the power of of um, generative AI, but but I'm wondering eh, that um, is it possible to create an app based on generative AI that that um, instead of um, you typing or uploading text, it would just be to just click buttons to to swipe something. So, so um, for for ease of use, without necessarily typing. Just wondering. I, I, to be honest, do not really understand maybe uh, what you meant. Uh, but you said IP. Maybe I didn't get oh, that. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Let me let me explain myself properly. Okay. Um, you know, from what you showed us, okay, right? You need to type. Okay. You want to, something that you can to talk to. Text. Yes. So I'm just thinking eh, that since users are are looking for for things to make their life easier can somebody build something on 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 the generative ai that mm -hmm. instead of having to type yes. you just click a button mm -hmm. or you swipe um, okay swipe something swipe. okay yes yes you can do all of that so all of 
all of those are input mediums. If you can even do voice. So instead of typing, you can be talking. And it can also talk back to you. So you don't even have to read. Say you don't want to read, you don't want to type. You just want to have a conversation. Talk to it and you hear back uh, you know, responses in voice. You can, you know, upload uh, attachments to it also. So let's say you already have the documents and you don't see why you should type or copy. You can also uh, just attach. Um, for example, when I was building something like this, if I wanted users to attach, uh, if I go to user experience, if I want users to attach, you know, documents when using this particular app, I would just enable it here. Okay, and say you can attach files up to this so 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 quantity. Now, if I launch it now, if I launch it now, it should have enabled you know the attachment option. So now I can attach okay. files. Yeah, so you can do that. Okay, but okay. if I don't need, if this particular use case does not require. Uh, users uploading anything, I just turn it off. So, yeah, just it's just user experience, and then we can enable voice, so that you just prompt it and you start recording. Um, let me go to let's see if okay, this is not available even in this is ChatGPT Plus. I want to see if okay, I think voice is not enabled there. But if you are using the app, the mobile app, you voice is already enabled. Okay, and yeah, you can also build your own application that can prompt the microphone of your device and you record. And then, yeah, the voice the, 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 the voice is converted to tests and it's sent over, you know, a whole lot of things can happen in the background and the user is only interacting with your microphone. Yeah, so there are different input mediums can be implemented. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, one last question for me. Okay. okay. Um, based on your experience and um, your your exposure, where do you think generative AI will be in the next five years? For example, if somebody wants to start learning now, where do where should the person start from? Considering where AI will be in the next five years. Okay. So if it's somebody who you know pretty uh had no um you know, serious experience before, where you may want to start with is, uh, you know, you can come on here and go to maybe developer tutor or that script we just created, that app we just created. I think I said I will put it in the store. Yeah, this prompt design, that's the first place to start because it helps you to understand how to have conversation with an AI system. And that's essentially where things need to start. Now, when you start having conversation with AI system and you are getting good responses, then you begin to write prompts that can, you know, uh, that can follow a process or follow a procedure. And when you are able to do that, then you can package that into an app, whether you are building it on GPT Desk or you are building it on ChatGPT Plus or ChatGPT Enterprise. All you are doing essentially is packaging your instruction that can, you know, achieve a particular business objective, and you know, and it works. So no, no extra coding is required. So that's why I said the place to start is to learn how to write good, you know, uh, prompts or good how, how to have good conversation with AI, and essentially is knowing how to speak good English, not good as in grammar error free, but communicative, something that you think uh, that is passing across your instruction, you know, adequately, effectively, and in, in a proper context. So that's essentially, that's where to start from. Now, when you are when you are pretty comfortable with that, and that shouldn't take you know so long, it, many people have improved just by going through our AI, uh, uh, dev tutor examples. But then the next thing you want to look at is what I dis discussed here, where there are different areas of learning. Um, there are different areas of learning depending on your level. And that is why you know we have only scratched the surface 
with the no code um, as, uh, examples that we have done today, okay, then you want to go further, you know. Uh, so these are different areas, excuse me, these different areas of learning that, you know, would be useful to you based on wherever you are in this scale. If you have, if you feel comfortable enough that you are intermediate level, you want to learn more into deep learning um, or TensorFlow, machine learning stuff. Those are a bit, you know, uh, uh, more technical or you can go further on the advanced level. So different areas, but starting today, I would say you want to take up the no code AI skills, which is basically writing good prompts for now. And when you are comfortable, then you can proceed to other other skill skill sets, which are essentially what is on this screen. But in five years, where AI is going to be, it's actually, it will be hard to imagine, but I, I can guess that uh, without sufficient AI skills, many people would actually be relevant in the next five years, starting from next year, essentially. Okay, I hope that answers. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. It does. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. I have a, I have a question. Um, I, I think you have begun to answer it. Thank you for the presentation. So I noticed that when you were prompting or instructing your AI on with the desk, you were copying some files. Um, in is it Studio? Visual yeah, Studio Code. Visual Studio Code, but you don't need Visual Studio Code. You, that's just a, any tests of uh, documents, any test software would would work. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the question I want to ask, which I suspect you've answered, is the logic and the skill to be able to when you decide what you want to build to be able mm -hmm. to come up with those text messages not text messages but you um the text instructions in okay. that sequencing how do you gain that skill because for me that seems to be the foundation of being able to engage in this context of not just prompting but building something else is this the same route uh, route as um yeah. learning to prompt exactly. or prompt engineering it, it is actually it is it is, you are correct. It's, it's prompt design and prompt engineering. Starting from prompt design, then prompt engineering, working and they work hand in hand. Sometimes it's, diff it's difficult to separate the two, but it's essentially, you know, and you have actually, you know, used the right words, giving your instruction in sequential order to get the result that you are looking for. And that thought process is the, the concept of prompt engineering. And I, or prompt design or prompt engineering. And I want to believe that that is a skill that everybody will need to have. Even if you can't write any, any code to build any AI application, but that skill to be able to communicate effectively with an AI system is going to be very much in demand. Like I believe everybody needs to have that skill. Okay. Okay, so what's the best way to to build on this? Like, is it the foundation? I, I can see the bene the beginner level recommendations you've made from Google and Intel. So it's just to go on a self learning journey with it, right? I I think uh, EUS and Tech may be able to answer that better as a learning organization. I just okay. took the opportunity to discuss this with everyone. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let okay. me answer that question. So are you, if you are an, an alumni, before we get to bed, I'm going to share like um, a Google link where you can just take some course on artificial intelligence, LLMs and all of that. However, the practical side of it, I can guarantee you that you will not be able to learn it on all of those platforms. So we will be launching the Anton course on user and tech come January. So I okay, hope I answered. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, welcome. But 
before then, I'll share all of the platforms where you can just, you know, take a theoretical, you know, class to have an understanding of how it works. But for the hands-on approach on how to build your products, how to work effectively at your place of work, right? All of that will be done in class. Okay, so this link, this uh, links you're going to share, are you sharing it to the Telegram group? Oh, okay. Yes, on the tele both on the Telegram and we have several groups, so we, share, we just share everything there. You can confirm what okay. group you're on, so we'll be sure as to where to drop the links. Okay. Um, one minute, let me just check because I'm not sure okay. exactly. All right, then a um, quick question for the for the prompt. I'm on the I'm on the Hills and Tech community. Community, okay. Okay. Yeah. Then for the prompt engineering, this session is for Mr. Adifoku. Is it the same prompt engineering um roles where there was an hype what there was an hype about the salary being about eight fifty thousand dollars or something like that? It is the same. It's not different. It's the same. <laughs> okay. 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 And it, and you can do it all of that without coding, right? Yes, es 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 essentially. Okay. All right, sir. Okay, so let me allow any other person to ask questions. Okay, Sylvia's uh, hand has been up for a bit. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Tomiwa. Thank you so much. Okay, it seems Alexandra, Silva, and Victor, seems they have questions. Or you forgot to lower your hand. Yeah, this is Silva. Thank you. Okay, Silva. All right, please go ahead. All right. Thank you very much for the insight on generative AI. My question is, how do we leverage on AI in a typical office setting? And at the same time, avoid bridging data privacy and secrecy in an office setting. Okay, so um, I think it depends on the policies that the office are asking, that your business has in place. Um, some believe that they are comfortable with uh, open air enterprise. Uh, yeah, so there are. There are conditions that OpenAI has said they will meet if you are using the enterprise version. So if the office is using that, you may be as comfortable as the office is. Uh, Microsoft is also you know, building their own tools that you can also use as well. And then you can also build your own custom tools that works within your privacy boundaries uh, in your office. So, but let's say your office you know, uh, does not have any of those, you know, enterprise solutions in place and you just want to use ChatGPT. First, you need to be sure that your office does not even allow ChatGPT at all. There are offices that do not allow, you know, staff to use ChatGPT for, for work at all. So if your office allows ChatGPT, then the next step is what kind of information am I allowed to, to use? And you essentially want to consult your uh, privacy uh, guidelines in your office. Do they allow you to share client information? So whatever they don't allow you to use publicly, you probably don't want to put that in ChatGPT. Okay, so you just want to tread the 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 line between you know meeting your office guideline and also achieving productivity carefully. But once you are clear with what you are able to to use then there is another level of uh, of care of being careful which is uh to discern by yourself is this appropriate to share or not uh, and if it is then fine you can use that so i think it comes down essentially to you know the policies that your office has in place in terms of using ai and also uh, sharing information 
And like I said, if they subscribe to any enterprise platforms, then there is a level of coverage that those people have provided to say you can put in your data and we will secure it. If you are using, okay. yes. Okay. So Sorry, is there a way you can veil the information even if you don't use the office information in totality? Is there a way you can veil it and Absolutely. still get the required you, output you, and you, you integrate are... it into your office? Thank you. That's a good, that's a very, 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 very good idea you have you have put forward. Yes, you can you can do that. You can screen out the information uh that your office does not want, and then you are able to you would be able to use that. And then when you are done, it's like you decode it back to your office language on your own and then use it. That's that's fantastic. All that's right. fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, Tayo. Yeah, good evening. Thank you very much. Um, lovely presentation. Um, uh, I'm a lecturer, so uh, we have been having issues with uh, um, students using the uh, GPT for their projects. And uh, I just want to find out, are there easier ways to, you know, fish out this, um, oh, let me say, fraud? Uh, it's not. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not against it. I'm not against um, using artificial intelligence for your projects, but then I don't think it's appropriate for the student to just, you know, use artificial intelligence from the uh, introduction to the conclusion without even putting anything on its own. So, how uh, how can we mitigate that kind of uh, problem? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I think there are there are tools now. I think ChatGPT also released one recently that can help you detect, and that's even a a mandate that uh, government is putting forward to AI developers. That while you build these things, we want you to also build tools that people can use to separate AI work from human work. Okay which will be useful so there are tools out there that uh, can you know detect such a uh, fraud so to speak and then um yeah i you can even i think you can also just copy a content into chat and say what are the chances that i wrote this and what's a better way to do that let's say that's the only tool that you have it's not to ask ChatGPT, do you think this thing is written by AI? No. You can ask and say, to what degree in percentage is this content written by AI? And it's going to tell you that to 60%, you know, uh, to 40% or 80%. And then you can uh, be informed on, on that particular content if it's, if, and make your own decision. If, you want to trash it or accept it based on the percentage that it gives you. Yeah. Mm, all right. So um, if I may ask, uh, of course, I, I, I know it's not possible for us to stop the students from uh, using AI for their work. If I may ask, uh, in, in order to, in order to like be on the same level with them, what do you think you should tell them? I think As in, to what extent do we, if you will tell them that I they think, can go. I think the way we are asking workers to to improve on their own capability using AI is the same way a student should become smarter by using AI because when they are out of school, they are coming into an economy that will be dominated by AI. By so AI, if, yeah. yeah. So if from school we have prevented them from using a high then they will be at disadvantage so but what we can tell them is we can even give them you know targeted assignments to say go do this with a high but the lecturer yeah. would have structured that uh that homework in a way that is beneficial in a way that they will still have to do some research before they can get the result that is being expected. But yeah, to significantly, we should encourage them to use AI, but we also need to guide them uh, to be sure that we have uh, the kind of outcome that we expect. And that's, I think that's the lecturer's uh, 
prerogative to, to do. And it's essentially to give them assignments that they know that to get the result from AI won't be very straightforward. And all you need a student to do is to now be able to use their reasoning in a way that uh, they know when to use AI, they are able to consult AI, and they have an objective in mind, which the lecturer has defined. And that's how I think, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, lecturers can encourage students that, to use that, that AI without necessarily, you know, selling their brain, because we don't want people uh, to start using it. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. That's You're welcome. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Victor Babaride, Mr. Yeah, AU, AU. Yeah, good evening. This is Victor. Yes, take your question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Tomiwa. I'm glad I was a part of this webinar and I've embraced, I mean, I've learned a lot and I'm actually considering embracing AI, artificial intelligence in work. I'm a software developer and um, I find it um, kind of, I find it very difficult to accept AI. I'm one of those people <laughs> that find it very difficult to accept it. I understand Based where on, you're coming from. I feel, number one, I'm a proud software developer and I like the idea of writing everything, coding everything out by myself, knowing I was the one that built this from scratch. And uh, I find that very, 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 to, to, just, to just put aside and just having to um, just um, put myself in a position that I know is just something that wrote this thing for me and I'm just what literally just editing, editing here and there and all of, all of that. I feel like that makes me kind of is abstracting the whole process of the software development as programming, uh, intense programming, abstracting all of that and just putting all of that, uh, taking that all away from the whole software development process. Mm. And and I feel like um, regardless of how AI or the advances AI has, um, in the end, everything is built on some, is running on some software that was coded by somebody somewhere. Hello? Mm, I think his internet has gone off. Can I ask a question in the interim? Okay, please. All right, yes, please, hey, go ahead. Okay, so I was going to ask, I noticed you said AI can now see, and I was thinking about the integrations between different AI, will I say vehicles, like between Mid Journey, for example, ChatGPT. So if, and this is part one of the question. So if, for example, I see an image on Mid Journey that I like, but I want to um, copy the prompts from that, and I know like in Mid Journey, you can go and find like the prompts itself and copy, but to make it faster, is it a, is there is there a situation where I can put the image into GPT and ask GPT to um, extract the prompt that generated that oh, image in that. Mid Journey? My network. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so uh, Victor, please give me a bit. We have another question. All then right, thank you. I, once I'm once we are done with that, we will come back to you. Okay. So to your question, A, you uh you have created an image with me journey and you like that image, but you want uh ChatGPT to create a similar image for you, right? Or or some somebody has created an image that I like and I want chat GPT to extract the prompts that created that image. Okay, so um, let's say something like, let's find something. Let's say this. I'm just going to quickly save this. 
the, this looks like something that AI generated. So. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I'm just going to save. I don't know what is going to happen, but everything is worth, exper is worth experimenting. I would not say that I won't be, I won't say I will be surprised if it's able to do what we want, but let's see how it's going to go. Okay. So I've copied that. I'm going to bring it into chat GPT. Uh, yeah, desktop, I guess. Okay, screenshot. Generate the prompt that can create the image attached. Maybe in mid journey or no, okay. Oh, well, let's even see what it's going to. Okay, so this is what it thinks. Now, okay. I'm sure if you take this to mid journey or wherever, it's probably or going Dal -E. to be something similar or Dal E. Yeah, so let's let's mm -hmm. let's let's do that in ChatGPT and say create. Uh, okay, it's already the message already started with create image. So this is going to use that E. Yeah. Okay. So this simple process, like I said in the beginning, is consuming the energy it would take us to charge an iPhone from zero to 100%. Yeah, so that's the kind of resources that these things consume. Okay, so this is what it feels. Let's compare it to the original. I think it's similar. I think that answers the mm. question, right? So if you take the same prompt to to mid journey, you are going to get you know something similar, but it would give you the effects of mid journey. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you for the question. We have the, so the, the, the other the associated question, sorry to interrupt you, is for people who are in digital arts that use resources like mid journey and co. There's been a lot of conversation around the legal aspects, um, about around laws saying that the art is not yours essentially. Like people have access to it, or because it was generated or mid journey. Do you can you speak to that about how artists can still have rights to the art they create on through AI legally? Okay. To be honest, if I would speak to that, um. I would say that if you're an artist, uh, and I know for sure, there will still be a time that people will start looking for, you know, uh, original hearts created by human. Um, so I would say if, if you're an artist, you probably want to continue painting and enjoy painting instead of switching to, you know, digitally generated arts. Just like the question Baba uh, uh, Victor was asking before, AI is taking away its passion to write code and it's not liking it. Uh, maybe for him, it's, it may not be as significant as somebody who has learned how to use paint and brush to create beautiful stuff. And now AI can create the same thing. I think if I wire an artist, I will be depressed. But nevertheless, I believe there will be a time that people are going to pay good money to get original hearts created by painters when everywhere is saturated by digital hearts okay now to the private to the uh copyright matters or around ai generated content on 
to be honest, I cannot really speak to it. For now, everybody's enjoying the moment and creating different things. Make the money you can make right now. Uh, the laws are going to change. The technologies are going to change. You, we are going to grow in the journey. But I really wouldn't, you know, uh, bother myself very much around the copyrights, you know, matters uh, regarding content created at this time. And really, I'm not a lawyer, and I really can't say much about it. And that's an area that people are also investing in, uh, AI legal and stuff like that. So beyond creating stuff, there are other professions springing up, the ethics, the laws, the copyrights, resources, management, and all that. So I believe somebody on this call may pick interest. Maybe you're a lawyer. You may pick interest immediately and say, oh, on this conversation, somebody spoke about copyrights. How do we manage this and make a make a make you know a decent career out of it? So, but for me, I just want to create. I just want to create stuff and enjoy the moment. I really can't speak to the copyright matters. Okay, thank you. You're yeah, welcome. Okay, uh, Victor, you may continue with your question. Yeah, so sorry about the interruption. The network. Yes, thank you very much. Um. So yes, as I was saying earlier, um, I'm very much too passionate about programming, and I'll keep programming. I will just stop. <laughs> so, um, so, um, um, so I, I, so I feel like my questions. That's I bring them down to two questions. Um, so now, does um, a software developer embracing artificial intelligence does it make him or her a weaker software developer compared? Because I'm thinking, and I'm sure that is the actual conversation going on in the software development space currently, where the guys that are doing the hardcore engineering feel like you are a weaker person, you don't know how to code, that kind of thing. And um, when it comes to um, this thing, I understand most of um, everything, I mean, in software development is reusable, is, is reusable, reusable in the sense like uh, programming embraces usability as much as as possible but i think there are still some points where uh, deep down in, in the core of um, software development and even the ai processing and everything everything still runs on some code that was written by somebody somewhere and if we are to continuously abstract further 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 away from um programming i feel like eventually you will not be able by the time it comes to like okay fixing issues blah 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 in some points that will require the expertise of somebody that is a hardcore engineer, you might be at a disadvantage in that point. So okay. my as I don't know, that make me a weaker person embracing sort of development. And how did you go about like uh, uh, um, embracing out of um, wiring your psychology to accept it? Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. And uh, let me start from the answer back to the question. Um, the answer is what may be right in front of you, uh, which it's not only software developers that are at that are being threatened by AI. Even consultants, <laughs> if you the kind of conversation going on in the consulting world to say, would we have work to do when people can consult AI for anything? And you know, there are several businesses that are built on top advisory business. Now, imagine uh, if people don't need them anymore, but that's not going to happen. There would always be subject matter expertise, you know, people who have a deeper understanding of how things work or, or how a particular subject work. Uh, what is going to happen is that uh, those people would even become trainers for AI. They will become advisors for AI. They will sell their products as AI so that it's just like a teacher, for example, uh, and you can teach mathematics, but you are limited by space. You can only teach 500 students in your lecture hall. But then their advancement came and you are able to record your voice and put it online and people stream it, but it still doesn't feel like you teaching them because they are only watching what you have recorded. But now you have AI that can actually teach and can teach unlimited number of people. But you can still teach the AI your style, 
you can still give the AI more knowledge. You can still do a whole lot of stuff in that delivery. And all you are doing now is sending AI on a journey and you're asking it to go do stuff for you. Yes, you are not the one, you know, delivering anymore, but you are the one who programmed the AI to do what it's doing. You are the one who put the knowledge in it. You put the style in it. Uh, you see, when I was creating the apps, there is a place for contextual guidelines. That is what is going to make an app that I created different from an app that you created because I'm going to put in my own style into it and it's going to behave the way I have designed it to behave. Even if it's doing the same thing. Davido and uh, Bonaboy are both singing, but we some people prefer Davido, some people prefer Bonaboy. And it's simply because they put their elements in the music. And that's what we are going to have going forward. So as a software developer, you may be using AI. AI may be helping you to write the code, but the product is still going to inherently be you. And that's where creativity will come in. Uh, I was I, I I started using uh, GitHub uh, uh, Pilot Copilot recently. Let me actually demonstrate something. Uh, let's let's let me hope I can find it. I should be able to find it. Uh, which I find I I was wowed when I saw this. Uh, let's say this guy. Okay. So I don't know if it will work now, but today it was actually working. You see, it's working, right? So what it's doing is it has read what is in this in this uh, in this page on this page. It, it noticed that I'm writing some Nigerian stuff. So and it's following the same format. The previous one I have is shop nice. Now it's creating shop rights, supermarket grocery transaction lead slip. I press tab, enter. Uh, enter is going to suggest another thing, which is following that format. This is GitHub Copilot, right? Do I, would, should I, will I complain that is helping me to do this? Or I should still feel I should be the one doing this by myself? You know, I mean, this is, this is, this is it's, ama good. it's amazing, right? Yeah, so this is GitHub Copilot. Now, if I'm writing code, what I ask, let me open one of my codes. Uh, let me see. Uh, let me see if I can find any of my code. Open recent. Um, this is something here. Don't save. Uh, so, okay. What well, I shall want to say. Actually, on this call, you are probably the only one that would understand. But what I figured out is the copilot is not just generating code. It's actually writing in my style. And I find that incredibly, you know, fascinating. So he, he has read my code and it's writing the way I wrote. It's not writing the way Microsoft, you know, uh, programmers, you know, write code. It's not changing my style to something else. It's actually writing the code in a way that you know it figured that I write my programs. So, so essentially, as a developer, how do I then you know get to ad 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 accept that this has come? It's the simple fact that it has come, and the only thing that can happen if I don't accept that it has come is I will become redundant, <clears throat> and I don't want to be redundant. Uh, at my age, to be honest, I already, like I said earlier, I already have the 19 year old, 20 year old people, you know, coming up, writing great code. Do I want to compete with them? No, but what I have to do is to provide them guidance. That's growth, okay? So if AI is the one that I now have to compete with, no, I won't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't compete with it. I'm just going to turn it to my agent, you know, and it's going to do work for me. And I'm going to use it to achieve my goals. You know, that's just it. So the GitHub Copilot, I just, I was angry about it, to be honest, just the way you felt, you know, that. Uh, so what is now the purpose of many years that I've put in to get to this level, if uh, if a Copilot will be helping people to write. But while I used it, I see the value because it's just going to help me. 
it's going to help me to do my work faster. It's not going to change my brain. I'm still the one. And all I'm going to be doing as a developer going forward is thinking, you know, imagining, you know, how best things can be done. And then I now have like 5,000 developers in GitHub Copilot that can help me do my work. So it means that I can take on more jobs. I can take up more, you know, side businesses, side deals. And before I will be limited by you know by time but now i can work faster because i have something who can write the way i write who can program the way i program and all i need to do is just you know uh, give it illustration of what i want and then the code will come up so i think so it's, like your avatar you say i like my avatar i, I once watched, watched a south african movie uh i've forgotten the title now where people have zombies so you you capture somebody, you turn it to your you turn the person to your zombie, and then you'll be sending the person <clears throat> on errands. You know, exactly that is how I look at AI. So it's my zombie, and I can create as many zombies as I want, and they are going to go on errands for me to accomplish to accomplish my goals. So that's how I look at it. Okay, so they are not taking away my passion. I'm just able to replicate my passion uh, through them in many ways. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you very much. That really, that's enlightening. It helps a lot. Thank you. Very much. Let, let, let me also tell a story. Um, one of the AI leaders that I've worked with, you know, we were discussing about uh, uh, about people, uh, businesses that we consult for, you know, um, creating their own applications and they won't need us to help them. So I was the one saying that at a point, uh, they may be able to be creating these applications and they won't ask us, you know. And uh, she asked that not many companies, we have people like you, Tommy, who are in their business that can do this. And my response to her was, there will be a time that they are not going to need people like me. And that was a few months ago. That was before Microsoft started doing Copilot. That was before uh, OpenAI released GPTs. So, but at that moment, I decided, I knew that I knew that moment is going to come, that these tools are going to be available. And these companies may not call us actually to come and build AI for them again. Okay. And that is when I started working on GPT desk and say, okay, instead of that moment coming that people won't call me to ask them to do, to build stuff for them, maybe I will make them use my tool, you know, and that's how I started the project because I, instead of, of being di displaced, I want to rather create the tool that you know would keep that would I don't know how to that put it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to rather create that tool that would displace me <laughs> and let them use that tool. Do you get it? So that's how I think, and that's how I I manage to create the GPT desk. Okay, Tyre, you have your hands up. Do you have another question yeah. or is? Okay. Yeah, it's not a question particularly. I, I just want to add to Victor's uh, comment. I know Victor very well. He was one of my students, was one of my best. So oh. uh, I would just suggest to Victor that uh, if he wants to consider, he, he, he mentioned something uh, that uh, at the heart of everything, even with the AI, there are still some people writing the course for the AI. So he may want to continue in that line go deeper and deeper until he becomes a, a programmer that would actually be writing, uh, you know, the code for artificial intelligence. Yeah, that's another thing I wanted to say. <laughs> there are people working on open AI. So if your passion is to actually write code, never use, you know, a co-pilot, you really want to do serious machine learning, there will always be the jobs, you know, for people like that. And it's going to be high paying jobs. OpenAI is one of the highest paying companies in the world. They pay programmers up to $800,000 per year, you know, yeah. and, and they are not just giving away the money. It's because they know these programmers have what it takes, you know. Uh, yeah, so if you really want to be that kind of programmer, there will always be space for you out there, always. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tyler. <laughs> Yes, I also like to add that during the Open AI saga, the CEO of Salesforce was actually trying to poach, you know, lots of developers from Open AI who were not ready to go to Microsoft. So there's going to be lots of demand. 
und rief wieder zu dem Mann. Okay. I think we have exhausted all the questions. We have spent some good time in the absence. Let's see whether some questions are left in the chat. Okay, none that I can see. Uh, okay. All right. So, use and tech. I think you can close the meeting. Yeah, thank, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you, Mr. Damua, for being so patient and kind, you know, to sharing your knowledge with us of open air. You know, one thing we really worry about is when such skills, you know, when such skills are, are popular like that, the, the, my worry is usually the scalability, the, the access quality talents who are able to do this. But I'm very certain that, you know, when you come on board, who use and tech is going to be able to produce lots of quality, quality generative AI professionals come 2024. So thank you for your patience and thank you on board. Thank you for coming on board to sharing your knowledge with us. And to our potential students, alumni, community members, thanks for finding time to Come on board. So without further ado, we'll be going up now. If you have any other questions, please send us an email, send us a DM on our Instagram, send us a message on our WhatsApp or Telegram. We'll be happy to you know answer them and then watch out for further announcements. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Mr. Tomwa, please make me the host before you leave. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.